So what I'm going to speak to you about today, I know we're talking about new forms of storytelling. My company is called Story Central because I found maybe 2009-ish, nearly 10 years ago, when the transmedia word blew up, everybody ran to platforms. Um, I was lucky enough at that time, 2010, to be asked to produce and chair a conference in San Francisco and then in LA called Story World Conference. And this was the time when transmedia was the big, big word of the moment. And what I watched happen with great excitement and then horror was that people rushed to platform. I found there was a lot of people that had come out of film school, a lot of people that had always wanted to write a novel, suddenly found that the barriers to entry were down. So all of the old ways that we would get our work commissioned, television, movies, book, were gone. Because if you wanted to write the book, you could just simply blog it and push it out there online. If you wanted to make a short film, you could just put it up on YouTube. And I found this big, big rush to platform. And what I watched happen was the idea of story started to fade. So what I think everybody learned at that time was without a great story, this is just noise. There's so much out there, as we all know. There's probably like um, statistics of how many videos are loaded to YouTube every like second. There's so much out there. It raised the problem of discoverability and how do we find the work. So that's why my company was called Story Central because I could see this disregard for story. So basically, I'm pressing this too quickly. Everything has been done before, right? So I'm just going to give you three scenarios. The first scenario is this storyline, OK? A dangerous monster threatens a community. One man takes it on himself to kill the beast and restore happiness to the kingdom, right? Now, that is a really simple story structure, one that we probably all recognize. But that premise of that story is, of course, 1977 Jaws, right? We can really see the structure. A dangerous beast, one man goes in and fixes the problem. It's also other stories like, dear, dear, click, be a wolf. That goes way, way, way back in time. The Thing, Jurassic Park. We can really see that structure, a dangerous monster, one man, dot, 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 right? Godzilla. Then we have The Blob. OK, so we're now going back a little bit into the back in the day. It's pretty much every James Bond story, OK? We also have it shown in TV series. So that framework applies to the House, Spooks, ER and CSI. All of them work on this same premise. We also had the same story in Erin Brockovich, except for the, the dangerous beast is the corporation. In The Towering Inferno, the dangerous beast is the fire. So the metaphors still work. So that structure remains regardless of the protagonist of the story, the characters, and those layers of nuance that come into the story. The second one is this. Our hero stumbles into a brave new world. At first, he is transfixed by its splendor and glamour, but slowly things become more sinister. Again, it's a really traditional plot that we can see. Now, of course, this is Alice in Wonderland. She literally falls down the rabbit hole, right? This is very much a circular story structure. And when I talk about circular stories, I mean like Ferris wheel instead of carousel, right? So you literally, with this, you fall down the rabbit hole, you're transfixed and fascinated, then things become a bit weird and you want to get out, and you return to where you were before, but there's been some transition of your character. So that's obviously where she literally is down the rabbit hole. The Wizard of Oz, again. Both of these stories, I'm disappointed that they were just a dream at the end. Like I found with both of them, like, couldn't it have been something more real than just a dream? That's an easy get out clause, I think. Uh, Life on Mars, Gulliver's Travels, again, apply. Third scenario, when a community finds itself in peril and learns the solution lies in finding and retrieving an elixir far, far away, a member of the tribe takes it on themselves to undergo the perilous journey into the unknown. OK, so Raiders of the Lost Ark, very much this quest, crusade story. Watership Down, Lord of the Rings. Saving Private Ryan, Apocalypse Now, The Guns of Navarone. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Usual Suspects, Ocean's Eleven, all really different movies. But that same structure applies underneath. Easy Rider, Thelma and Louise. 
So then we look at the story of Peter Pan. Now, when I talk about story, this is the kind of story that has gone on for nearly 100 years. I think it was 1901 when this story first emerged, and it emerged as a play, a stage play, called Peter and Wendy. Now, that's gone on. That's such a strong story, and there's such a nice heartbeat to that story, based around a strong theme, basically, of never wanting to grow up. Now, that's a theme we can all relate to, right? So when I look at stories like this, and in terms of telling a story over many platforms, the theme is something that I believe needs to be really woven in very tightly. And it needs to be a theme that, as human beings, that we can all relate to. So it can explore different ideas and concepts, but if you can have a universal theme that we all really, really feel, then you've got something that you can create a series of experiences around that will work on different platforms. So with this theme of not wanting to grow up, which somehow we all will get, I'm sure. We had the story of Peter Pan as we know it. Then we had Hook, which I think was in 1991. Return to Neverland was in, I think, 2001. So we have these stories that have been told. They haven't tried to overtell all of it, but we can dip into different characters because we know the story world so well. So to resist the urge to tell everything in one story. So basically, this is where we are now, okay? We've got audiences at the forefront of modern storytelling. Our audiences are so tuned in, and they have absolute choice of where they consume their content. They're vocal and active on social media. If they don't like what you've done, they're not going to hide it. So there's nowhere for us to hide as storytellers. So that means, as storytellers, we need genuine, relevant, and credible processes to build story worlds. We need to understand the fundamentals of themed storytelling. Bless you. And we need to also understand the levels of immersion and experience design. So when I talk about levels of immersion, there will be people in your audiences that just simply want to watch what you've done. They don't want to find a clue. They don't want to find a character on Twitter or YouTube or Snapchat. They just want a surface level of enjoying your content. But depending on the pacing and the genre, and also the theme of your story, they might just want to dig a little bit deeper. You might find ways that you could place clues within the film or within the story that they then can find in other places. But that applies quite tightly to the pacing and timing of your story. Comedy and romance, I have found, people don't want to dig into that. Like if I was a comedian telling you a joke and I got halfway through and went, and now you tell me the punchline, you'd be like, what the hell? Like, you're telling me? It's the same with romance. I massively failed with my master's degree project because I told a romantic story, 69 days of a romantic story online, and on day 70, I turned the whole thing to the audience and went, and now you decide who she dates. And nobody wanted to decide. They were like, well, we've gone 70 days and now you want us to do something. That's like the horrible thing of going to a show and you watch this show and you're quite enjoying it. And then I suddenly come down with the mic and go, hey, yeah, what do you think? And you're like, ah, oh, no, I didn't know it'd be like that. So to want them to engage, you have to build that in early. Otherwise, they're freaked out. They didn't realise that they had to play a role. So in terms of the pacing and the timing of your story, you could find ways, not comedy and romance, to get them to dig in and try and join in. So the new adventures of Peter and Wendy goes back to the Peter Pan story. And this has been a new retelling of this story, told by some of the creators of Lizzie Bennet Diaries and told in a very transmedia way. There's lots of assets that roll out across a series of platforms. Um, I'll show you a quick clip. I don't want to show it all because it just goes on and on a little bit, to be honest. But just for the purposes of showing you the tone and the pacing of how this works. This is Dear Darling, and today's topic is growing up. The only thing you'll ever need to know about growing up is, don't do it, bitch, or trap. Remember when I said that everyone grows up? Well, everyone but one. Wendy Moira Angela Darling. It was the most beautiful name I'd ever heard. Would it be weird if Wendy and I were more than just friends? Well, that changes a couple things. Peter Penguin to match your service. Ah. Am I the only normal one in this family, or is it genetic? And I'm just a ticking time bomb of crazy. You taste as horrible as you read! I'm not comfortable being on camera. You never know who's watching. The world must be clean! That was thorough. 
Thank you. As I've rejected so many men, and she's been rejected by so many men. Hi, Michael, the good-looking sibling. I play a lot of video games, and I smoke a lot of hams. Yes, you do. You smoke those hams, and they're delicious. Mm-hmm. I know that growing up can seem scary, but we've all got to do it. Man, what do you think life would be like five years from now? It is not always about what you want, Peter. That's right, my darlings. I'm ready to leave Neverland. What is so wrong with Neverland? Have you ever wanted to see the world? Did you put your mark on it? Is want so bad? I mean, is it bad that I want to tell you how great you are? Let me finish. I thought this day would never come. Yes! 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 Okay, so you get the idea, right? So the big question is, if stories haven't changed, which they absolutely haven't, that structure is timeless, and we won't change that. Whether you're working in three acts or five acts, the structure of story, of that idea of voyage and return won't go. So if that's the case, why are we talking about doing things in new ways? And the reason why is, there is an evolution of conversation between storyteller and audiences. So when I said to you that our audiences are now really vocal and active on social media and there's nowhere to hide, this is the situation. So we as storytellers, whether we are big networks or whether we are independent storytellers, have an opportunity to have a dialogue with our audiences. Now that used to be pretty much impossible. My first steps into storytelling was as a novelist had three books published, and this was back like 2004. And I used to stand in the bookshop with my mum, hiding, going, you know, like watching people pick up the book from the shelf, and we'd go, yeah, 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 no, oh, she's put it down, right? That was the only way. And I'd never go up and actually say to anyone, I had to do a signing once in a bookstore, and there was about four people in the queue, right? So I'm signing the books, and all of a sudden, somebody put a book under me to sign, and it wasn't my book. I didn't even know who I was, right? I was just giving me the wrong books to sign. I didn't sign it, by the way. I did tell her that it wasn't me. But the, the point is, even like 10 years ago, it was so difficult to know who our audiences were. You know, I kind of knew who my audience was when I wrote my books. If I was writing uh, journalism pieces, then I would copy the tone of the publication. Um, if you were writing for television, you would pretty much write for the tone of that channel. But we didn't know who the audiences were. Now we do. So in terms of this evolution of conversation, a friend of mine in LA had done a brilliant study for Intel a few years ago and had to find there are now four levels of conversation between storytellers and audiences. Okay? The study was done by a guy called Brian Seth Hurst from a company called Storytech. They're now moving into VR and doing some really fun things in that space, based partly on what they've learned through this study. The first level of conversation between storyteller and audience is the broadcast model. The broadcast model is basically pumping stories down a pipeline to a television in the corner of somebody's room and then going like this, right? It's basically you saying, sorry, we're closed. Because this is going back to the old model. We used to not have any choice. We had a limited uh, selection of TV channels. We could get our news from a newspaper. We would read our books or our stories in a book. We had limited choice, so we went to where we knew we could get stories. And there was no interaction back. Those days are gone. We've had 150 years of the broadcast model, and it's pretty dead, because people now want that interaction. The second level of, story, of evolution of um, conversation between storyteller and audience is, I'm listening. And this is my favourite model, because I think this is quite easy to adopt. The I'm listening model is basically you saying to your audience, OK, I know you're there, here I am, I'm ready to have some kind of like chat with you and listen to what you want. You're not going to change anything necessarily, but I'm open to hearing your thoughts. And at the end of the day, regardless of storytelling, isn't that what everybody wants? Just a chance to be heard, just a chance to have their voice out there? So the I'm listening model is what was used with John Chu's Legion of Extraordinary Dancers, but also with Justin Bieber's Believe. Now, talking about listening, there's an illusion of that, right? So we all can remember being in class and being taught something by the teacher, but we've got other things going on, so we're not listening, and you pretend to listen. So when someone looks at you, you kind of nod, 
to pretend you're listening, but we're not. And sometimes that's cool. Sometimes there's other things we have to do on our phones or our head is somewhere else. It's okay sometimes not to listen. But the illusion of listening is quite fun. So what happened with Justin Bieber's Believe is they would take photos from the shoot and put it out on social media. Now, basically, they knew who their fans were. It was the teenage girls. And the teenage girls loved being asked things like, in the next scene, sorry, I've gone too far, in the next scene, should Bieber, for example, wear the black hat or the white hat? Now, we obviously know they didn't hold the shoot and wait and see what the responses were. That scene was already done and dusted and in the can with the black hat on, right? But the fact was, the audiences felt like they had a choice. The audience were like, oh my God, they're asking us. It made no difference to anything if you wore the black or the white hat, right? But the teenage girls in the audience were like, oh my God, they're asking us what we want. So the, uh, the reply was simple, like hashtag black or hashtag white, right? It made no difference. But then when the movie came out, there was a series of things like this throughout where the girls were like, yeah, they chose the black hat, right? It made no difference to anyone. I doubt, perhaps, that anyone was even watching those responses, but it was the illusion of interactivity, the illusion of listening. Now, this works in two ways with your stories. This can work very nicely in the runway phase. I think it's especially difficult for filmmakers because you've got 90 minutes of somebody's attention for your film. With television, the idea of episodic content, there's gaps in between the episodes. You know, you can even pause it and wait and look something up on your phone. But with film, it's a completely different experience. Film is a 90-minute immersive, in the best scenario, in the dark, with a massive screen. You don't want to check your phone. You don't want to write a story so people are, like, scrolling through something. So with film, you need to use the three phases to their optimum. The runway phase, is how you engage audiences before your film hits. The live phase, while your film is out, will be perhaps little stories that could be uncovered around that period of time of your live period. <coughs> and then the community phase after is how do you keep talking to them if they want more? Why would you let them walk out of the theatre and go, oh, yeah, that's it then, we're done with that? You know, wouldn't it be great if they could find a way of continuing the story, whether it's through a little graphic novel or a little web series or even content you've shot as extra content when you're shooting your film? So this idea of listening works in the runway phase and building that community, but also even when you're in development. If you're thinking of, of creating a story or a film, connect with the communities that you know could be your audience and maybe try and get some loyalty and engagement there. It could even help to change the way you write the story, perhaps. The third level is welcome to my world. And this is you saying, OK, come in. Here's my story world. You're actually not going to change anything in this either. But you're really welcome to mix things up and create mashups and do what you want to do. But I'm not changing the story. This is what Tim Kring did with Heroes. With Heroes, the characters were introduced online before the TV show was live. Now, that meant it gave the community a lot of opportunity to get to understand the characters, to kind of understand some of the motivations as why they acted certain ways, even down to the clothing brands they would wear and stuff like that. But the fact with this was it meant that the fan wiki page became so well documented by the fans, it got to a point where the writers put their story bible to one side and referred to the fan wiki because the fans were so brilliant at keeping this absolutely up to date. Right? So that's kind of a nice example of welcome to my world. The fourth level, I wouldn't go anywhere near, which is basically take it, it's yours. Right? Eric Kripke did this with Supernatural, especially the last seasons, where he actually said, co-create some canon with me. Here's what I've got. You know where I'm going. I've done seven seasons by now. You know how this goes. Come in and create canon. And some of that canon he actually wove in to the season. Some of it he disregarded, of course. He had to make sure it was relevant. Apparently, 50% of the fans loved it, that he was actually co-creating a shared story world with them. And 50% of the fans hated it. Either way, he got a lot of press and PR out of it. But um, this idea of co-creating together, I mean, that's scary stuff, if you ask me, right? You've got to be someone like Kripke, and you've got to be seven seasons in before you open the door for that, because then you run the risk of just being stampeded, and they take it off, and you've lost everything. OK, so this is sort of my map of how I approach 
looking at a story and helping to develop it in a way that you can touch some of these bases, right? It took me nine years to build this thing. I know it's ridiculous, right? But this has been part of my PhD research, and it's, I know it's evolving. So basically, there's a way to read this. I'm not going to spend too long, because it kind of gets a bit deep sometimes. But basically, you start with story. That's why that's right in the middle. Don't attempt any of this if you don't have an idea for a story. Now, the problem I found, the pink section, is where people were rushing to back in 2007, when transmedia was the thing. They all rushed to platform. They're like, OK, I'm going to tell a story. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. No, now, we don't know about the rest, but it's OK. That's where we're going, because that's where everybody is. That's a recipe for disaster. So I begin with story, and then we first of all go to the green section. The first thing I try to figure out with anyone I work with is what's the big idea, what's the theme of your story? Because the theme of your story, in the way I work, informs pretty much everything. It helps inform the genre, the pacing, the tone. It helps also to define who your audience are. It also helps to build the experiential part of that. So if your theme, for example, is Star Wars kind of story of light versus dark, how can you make your audiences feel that pressure of how easy it is to go to the dark side when things are bad, when really we should all try and rise up and stay in the light side, right? So you don't put it up front. You don't say to your audiences, hey, this is going to be an experience where you're going to go to the blah, blah, blah. But you, they feel it through a series of options or opportunities you give them through social media or beyond. How do they feel the same conflict as your characters? You know, how could they maybe want to click on that, but they really know they should click on that, right? So the theme, the big idea, affects as we go around the audience and the experience and the platforms. That very much rolls around that way. But mostly we read this going out. So we figure out the theme, then we figure out the story world. Where's your story taking place? How can you build that out? If your story is taking place in an apartment block, how can you build it out just to make it maybe be the street or maybe the district? Because the bigger your story world is, the more opportunities you have to tell more stories around that scenario. The location of your um, story, Mad Men was way back in the 1950s. Well, not that much way back, but way back in the 1950s. It gave it a completely different feel because we had all of the politics, we had the dynamics, they were all smoking at their desks, all of the women were secretaries, it was only Peggy that broke through. So the dynamics of Mad Men if it was in the modern day, it might have been like HBO's Suits, but the fact they rolled it back 50 years gave it a different feel. So just thinking of things like that around the location of your story. Uh, the genre, of course, crime, sci-fi, thriller, horror, loads of gaps. Detective stories, lots of gaps. Those kinds of stories, we enter a scene late and leave a scene early. So we could enter a scene and there's a dead body on the floor and a black leather glove. And then before we've got a chance to look around, we're out. And the next scene could be a cab driver driving with one black leather glove. We work really hard to fill the gaps in, in crime, sci-fi, thriller and horror. Those kinds of stories are brilliant to have ancillary or transmedia content around because we're already doing the work. We feel like it's quite relaxing, but it's actually not. We're putting really kind of unrelated things together to make the story how we think it should be. And like I've said, romance and comedy, it's not so much. So how the genre of your story can affect the experience design. Characters and archetypes, I'm a big fan of looking at archetypes and not stereotypes. The hero archetype um, would be, for example, Luke Skywalker. But the hero could also be that single mum who's working three or four jobs just to keep everything ticking over. She doesn't look like the hero. She maybe looks like Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, the innocent, but there's something in her that's the hero. So to look at archetypes rather than stereotypes actually opens up how you can engage with your audience. Because if you look at your characters as archetypes and your audience as archetypes, then you actually change the dynamics of how you're interacting with people. It's not, you know, all 35-year-old men are going to like this story, if that's the hero archetype, you might find that there's a seven-year-old kid who's like a real Luke Skywalker inside that might love the story you're telling. So I think scrap the idea of stereotypes. So then we look at audiences. 
genres and behaviours, I've already said. Crime, sci-fi, thriller, da-da-da. Integrate an idea of experience, design and behaviour. So have a look at how that works. Level of immersion, I've talked about that already. How deep do you want them to go? Barriers to entry, what would stop them from taking part? So with Twilight, you don't have to know a lot about Twilight to realise that the vampires don't die in the sunlight. They just shimmer or glow or something, right? So it's quite a unique element to a vampire story because usually they die in the sunlight. So what kinds of things do they need to know, like your audience, to step in? Stories like Lord of the Rings, where there's huge, huge mythologies that need to be learned in order to really dig into the story, is a whole different experience design. Then we look at players and gamers. How can you make it fun? This is the big, big question. What do you want your audience to do? Why do you want them to do it? And what will you do when they've done it? Because just to say, hey, and then they'll run outside and click on a QR code. Like, they might do that, but then what? If that's a dead end, they're going to hate you. And you're going to have a bad name, and then they'll see something you've done again and go, oh, you know what, it's that thing. They get us running around the streets, looking for post-it notes underneath seats and stuff. <laughs> Nothing happens, right? So what do you want them to do, really? Like, it's really a big part of the experiential element. And why do you want them to do it? Not just to serve you. It has to be something embedded in the story. And let them have some kind of payoff or reward for doing it. That could be a play-in system of, like, leaderboards. That could be some kind of status. They might level up to more of an engaged player. Figure out what you want them to do and why. User-generated content. That's a dodgy thing. Do you want it? Why do you want it? If you want it, you have to know why and what you're going to do with it and what do they get from doing that. Asking people to go and shoot videos of themselves, you know, dancing on the top of a mountain is good fun, perhaps, but why? And what do they get back? Then we start looking at experience design. Now, once you've figured these things out, the experience design becomes a little easier because you've already answered some of the tough questions in terms of the genre, the pacing, who they are, what you want them to do, the theme of your story. So then we look at experience and experience design, interaction, participation. And for me, that's the part that makes the transmedia elements work, because you already know some of the tough stuff. So you can see now, with all of those questions answered, the platforms suddenly become a little easier, because you know who you're telling a story for. You know why, you know the pace, you know what you want to happen at the end. I've worked with some documentaries that um, have been in development for a long time. And I'll say to them, what do you want from this? Like, at the end of the day, what does success look like? This documentary, what's it going to do? And they'll go, well, I'd like it to raise awareness. Like, oh, yeah, it's kind of good, but it's a bit boring, really. Because what that means is, you've worked on this documentary for five years. We all sit in a room, watch it, and we go, oh, my God, oh, my God, that's terrible. Then we leave and go, oh my God, I didn't know it was that bad. Did you know it was that bad? I didn't know it was that bad. Anyway, OK. And you're gone. Raising awareness is noble and good, but it's not enough. So beyond raising awareness, what do you want to do? Activate behaviour change? Um, you know, get policymakers to look at new policy? What do you really want be beyond raising awareness? Because to know what you want, then you can backtrack from that point. So in terms of the experience design and the platforms and the formats and the packaging, all of these tough questions to be considered early on help you so much easier to cast your fishing rod and cast your line to where success is and then roll back from that and create the strategic steps to get there. So then we start looking at the blue section. It becomes a little bit more business focused. You know, what's your business model, your rollout and distribution plan, um, your franchises, timelines, runways. You know, if you've got a film coming out and you know your live period for the film is three weeks, you're not going to have a six-month runway. People will be bored and it will have diluted itself to a point that by the time you go live, they've forgotten about it. So even the runway part has to be in with the tone of everything that you've done here. Do you want them to find lots of stuff quickly in three weeks and then bang, you hit them with a movie for two weeks and then it's gone? And then everyone's going, oh my God, that's gone. We had a load of fun with that. Where is it? Let's find it. You're better to cut it short than to try and overtell it all and run the risk of boring people. So basically, in not such a quick overview, that's my approach to this, which is why whenever I go into work with new companies, whether they're the big Fortune 500s or they're independent filmmakers or storytellers, I don't ever have the answers to their questions. But what I can do is go through this section with them 
give them case studies, give them ideas. If they're stuck, we can talk about theme and pacing and structure so that they come up with the right answers for them. And then we can work on this pink and blue part to actually create a strategy and a business model around the project. Oh, OK, press. Right, so, haha, <laughs> puffed myself out then. Right, okay, so this is basically a, um, an excerpt from a Henry Jenkins' book, 2006. This is old school now, right? Uh, a Hollywood scriptwriter, no idea who that was, but it was a Hollywood scriptwriter said this. When I first started, you'd pitch a story, because without a good story, you didn't have a film. Once sequels started to take off, you pitched a character, because a good character could support multiple stories. That's kind of like Jack Sparrow in Pirates of the Caribbean. You could put him in any story, and you know exactly what he would do. He'd be fun, disruptive, naughty, playful, irreverent. You know what he'd do. But now you pitch a world, because a world can support multiple characters and multiple stories across multiple media. That's Harry Potter, that's Game of Thrones. OK, you've got this story world that can expand. And I believe, I know it's a lot of work, but to just pitch a story, and not have the characters and the world built, you're backing yourself into a corner. Like, I know the amount of work that goes into this. I've written web series, I've written books, I've done journalism, I've written plays. It's a lot of work. And even once the work's done, it's really hard to get it out there. So why would you back yourself into a corner and just tell a story? If you ever go to the um, Harry Potter um, experience just outside of London, the Warner Brothers experience. As you walk in, there's a huge triangle on the wall, and it's cut off like a big iceberg, and it's cut off really near the top. And the bit at the top, the small triangle at the top, is what we've seen of what J.K. Rowling has written for Harry Potter. And all of the rest of that wall, and it is literally the height of that wall, is the research that she's done, the story and the world that she'd built that we still have not seen. And that's a lot of work, I know that. But just to have all of this other content that's really rich, that you can, if you decide to, begin to tell in different ways. But it must be story-centric and not platform-centric. I know that you might be writing a film or a TV series, so it is going to be platform-centric to that point, but the story has to be the thing that holds it all together. So let's just take a quick look at theme, the big idea. So, there's a really cool TED talk by a guy called Simon Sinek, I don't know if anyone's seen it, called Start With Why. Or maybe he calls it the golden circle now, but anyway, Start With Why. And he plays off Microsoft and Apple. So he would say, this is not exactly correct, but it's kind of like this, right? He would say, when Microsoft bring out a new product, they start by telling you what it is. And we're so used to think people telling us what they're selling. You walk down the street and your phone's buzzing with alerts from different stores. We've got banner ads popping up when we're online. We've got buses with ads on the side and bus stops and newspapers. Everyone's telling us what they're doing. Like, we're tired of it. It's a bit boring. We can't take it all in. Everyone's trying to sell us something. They all want our eyeballs, right? They want our attention. What Apple do is far smarter. Apple start in the middle and they tell you why they've done something. So Apple would basically present us with a problem. They would say, OK, we have, I don't know, devised a new piece of software because we have realised that you're all really bad to managing your money, really bad. So because we know you're bad at managing your money, we've created this new piece of software or a new app, and it will manage your money for you. And you go, wow, like, so how does it work? Well, then they present us with the solution to the problem. It works this way. You connect it to your bank accounts, and it you know, filters everything you're doing, la, 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 right? They've basically told us a story. They've given us why they've done something, like the problem, and how they've fixed it, the solution. That's a story. So then we might go, oh my god, that's amazing. What is it? And they go, well, it's just this app called whatever. Might be quite disappointing when you get to that point. But they start with this story. They say why they've done it and how it's going to work. So what that might mean is when we get to what it is, we might go, oh, yeah, like, you know, we don't really need that. Or it could be a new device that's like 800 euro. We'll go, yeah, forget it. We don't want that. But what it has done is given us the story to tell other people. So we're out with their friends, having a beer. And your friend might say, did you see Apple's bought out a new like, iPhone 10 or whatever? And you go, yeah, you know why they've done that? Because da-da-da-da-da-da. 
you tell their story for them, right? So when you're looking at your own work, this works in two ways. This works in why you're telling your story, what your theme is, what you want to explore, how it's going to work. And that goes back to my map. Who's your audience? How do you want them to feel? What do you want them to do? So I want to tell a story that explores this and makes people feel that. It works in a way that I'm going to tell it as a series online that's going to drop three times a day for two weeks because that's going to be the kind of tension I want. And then what is it? This is what it is. So it works in terms of you planning, but it also works in terms of you pitching. Because if you go into pitch and you say what it is, I'm telling a story over these platforms, over this period of time about this, and it's going to work on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, you have back to yourself into a corner again. You might walk into that meeting and your phone bleeps and it says, Facebook's been like gone, Twitter's down, all of it, everything you've built it on disappears. If you walk in to pitch your work and say why you're telling it, as a kid, this happened to me, and I've grown up watching this happen to other people, and I want my story to explore this theme, and it want, I want people to feel like this about it. And how it works is like this. We're going to drop this series every day for two weeks, and we're going to ask people to do this. So you start with why and how yourself. So even if those platforms collapse as you walk into pitch, you have got something still that's robust and strong enough to adapt to whatever the new platform is going to be. So that really works in those two ways, your planning and your pitching. Click. So when we look at the theme or the heartbeat of the story, right, kind of breaking it down in a simple way, we've got the story of Star Trek. So you've got Captain Kirk at the middle, who's like the main man. But what you've really got either side of Captain Kirk is Spock and McCoy. Spock has zero emotion. Everything Spock does is with his head. He has no feeling for anything. I think one of his lines even is, it's logical, Captain. Everything's up here. McCoy is completely different. McCoy is all about his feeling in his gut and his heart and emotional. So what you've really got with Star Trek is a story constantly of reason versus emotion, logic versus feelings. That's the kind of theme as humans we get. We've all been in a situation where our head tells us we should do that, but our heart tells us we should do that, and it's never an easy decision. That's the kind of theme you want, something that even if you're from the darkest, most underdeveloped place in the world, you'd get that feeling. Or even if you're the biggest billionaire ever that can have whatever they want, they get that feeling. That's the kind of theme that I would encourage you to try and find. So although it looks like Kirk is the main guy, He's constantly weighing up, head or heart, head or heart, and finding somewhere in the middle of that to inform his decisions. Star Wars, I've already said this story of light versus dark. It's very clear, right down to the costuming of Darth Vader to Luke Skywalker. So you want this idea of a theme that is a humane theme. That's what I believe will make your story work better across a series of platforms, because people feel the conflict, like they really feel it in terms of like their own personal lives, which makes them relate to your story better. If we look at Avatar, it looks like quite um, a fictitious story about the world of Pandora, and it looks like quite a political message because the, uh, the Na'vi are trying to protect Pandora from being pretty much ripped up. But the message of Avatar is the ability to see. So the big eyes in all of the different movie posters, console games, everything you look for Avatar, has the big eye, and that's not a coincidence. I don't believe it came out as strongly in the Avatar movie as the intention was, and I know having spoken to the people at Lightstorm, they're working very hard now to bring that theme forward. And in our messed up world, this idea of seeing each other is powerful stuff. We're so defined by so many external things, age, race, religion, gender, whatever, wealth, you name it. And to actually see each other is powerful, powerful stuff. So this idea of looking and seeing different ways to live. Now, that works for all of the main characters. It works for the Na'vi, who actually eventually see Jack Sully for who he is and welcome him in. It works for Jack Sully, who first goes in like seven foot tall and blue and run in and crazy. But he sees them. Like, he actually sees beyond their appearance and he sees them. 
It even works for Sigourney Weaver's character, who's been working in Pandora for years, but never, as much as she knows about them, she's never really seen them. So through Jack Sully, she sees them too. The one person it doesn't work for is the guy who gets killed in the end in the big robot legs and he gets the harpoon or whatever it is, right? He never actually has that moment where he sees what he's doing or he sees the, sees the people of Pandora. Mad Men, I think it's episode one, 14 minutes in to Mad Men. This guy says, we're supposed to believe that people are living one way while secretly thinking the exact opposite. That's ridiculous. Now, this character in Mad Men is secretly gay. We're back in the 1950s in New York. And as kind of cosmopolitan as that was, he didn't want anybody to know. So he said this line. He's flicking through a copy of Playboy magazine or something. And he says this line. That basically underpins the entire series of Mad Men. All of the characters, the main characters in Mad Men, are secretly pretending to be a certain way, but it's actually quite the exact opposite. Even Don Draper... He isn't Don Draper. He's like Dick Whitman or somebody, right? So everyone in Mad Men has this persona, the clothing's amazing, the bars, the cocktails, all of that. But under every character, he nails the entire, entire story, 14 minutes in, and we don't notice. I've got lots of examples of that, but I haven't got time to tell you. So, right, looking at audiences, look at your audiences as tribes. Right? Kinds of people that you can segregate. And I call this exclusive inclusivity, which kind of sounds like it's a bit of a contradiction, but it's actually not. And I've called it districts, houses, and sorting hats. The idea of exclusive inclusivity invites your audience to be part of something. And it's a weird way to compare it, but think of it like religion, for example. Right? There could be millions of people in one religion, but they're not the majority. No matter how many people are in it, there's still even more people who aren't in that religion. So they feel exclusive because they're part of a community and part of something, but there's so many of them, they feel included as well. And the idea of in exclusive inclusivity is to make people feel special, that they're part of your story world or your tribe, if you like, but also they're in it together. That's a big, big feeling. That is like when um, people, for example, go to Disneyland for holiday and they're there for two weeks and they meet another family or meet some friends they've never met before and they experience Disneyland or Disney World and Florida with this other family for two weeks. That friendship often continues way beyond that holiday. There's something strong and powerful about a shared experience. And those kinds of shared experiences are what create loyalty and friendship. And if you can build that within your story, in the runway phase, in the live phase, or in the community phase, you've hooked into something really quite special. So with Harry Potter, we have the sorting hats that segregates the students into different types. Um, with districts, with um, Hunger Games, where they were segregated by the districts. And houses, of course, as well, is Harry Potter. So, click, click. Be part of something. So you're creating a story, whether it's a film or a TV series or a web series. And I know from the perspective of being a writer, it's really easy to lose yourself in the bubble of writing. You've really got to step out of that and figure, how can you do your work justice and invite your audiences to be part of something? That's really what you want to do, because it's all about who your audience are and where they're hanging out. So like in Harry Potter, we've got the four houses. So Harry Potter's a story of witches and wizards in terms of like equally across teachers and students. We've got a hierarchy. But within the student sector, which is primarily the audience of Harry Potter, these students are segregated into four houses. So they don't segregate the teachers, they don't segregate the witches and the wizards, they separate the students, because that's their primary market for Harry Potter. So we have the four houses, and all of them have very, very different codes of conduct, mythologies, um, conflicts, and behaviour types. And the fun thing with Harry Potter is the sorting hat just knew which house you should be in, right? That saved a lot of work, I think. Um, 
But the idea then that your, your audience, as readers or viewers, can go, do you know what, yeah, I'm definitely like a Hufflepuff. Like, I'm really feeling that that's my kind of archetype, where I want to hang out with those guys. So find ways of defining who your target audience is and create these structures within your story to allow them to be part of something. In Hunger Games, there was a big campaign that ran out at that same time by Lionsgate where you could be a part of one of these districts. That was quite funny. That all ran out on Facebook. Again, they knew who their audience were. And my little story about that is... You signed up through Facebook. It took your profile picture and created a like, digital ID card for you that you would share on your social media. You couldn't choose which district you was in. I've got a friend in San Francisco, a guy who's a filmmaker, and he's the absolute worst stereotype. I don't do stereotypes. With this guy, I do. The worst stereotype of a really bad filmmaker. Big guy, baseball cap, always got a big cigar, really not politically correct, ever. He's racist, he's sexist, he says what he thinks every time. There's no filter. It's horrendous. It's kind of hilarious, but it's horrendous at the same time. And he, any woman he's around, he's like trying to hit up with the women all the time. It's just awful, right? I've got a friend in Paris who literally is a stereotype of a perfect ballerina. She's beautiful, she's tiny, she's elegant, it's amazing. If he met her, my God, it would be horrendous. She'd be so offended. So as this was rolling out, they both came onto Facebook under the same district. And I thought, oh no. They realised that I was a mutual friend, and I saw that they became friends on Facebook. I'm thinking, this is going to go so wrong. So I messaged her and I said, did you send him the friend request or did he send you? She said, oh, no, he sent me. Like, I didn't need to ask, really. It was obvious. Uh, I'm like, OK. I said, just watch him. Like, he is lovely, but he's really wrong, you know. Just don't be too giving and anything. The friendship just grew and blossomed. He never went there with anything weird with her because all of their conversations were around this. They were part of something together. They were in the same district. They were trying to figure it out. They were messaging each other with gameplay stuff. It was weird. And I think to this day, they're still friends on Facebook. I think if they ever meet, it might change. But um, the point is, they had a shared experience. There was a reason for them to be friends. And they were part of something together. So I thought that was always quite funny that, you know, like I say, if they'd met, pff, it would not have been a friendship. Okay. Again, this is um, Game of Thrones, and you can see quite clearly there's seven kingdoms within Game of Thrones. So this idea of just taking that time when you're building your story to develop these opportunities for community. Kevin Spacey gave this um, keynote in, I think, 2014. It was the first season for um, House of Cards. And he said, you have this incredible confluence of a medium coming into its own just as the technology is drastically shifting. Studios and networks who ignore the shift, whether the increasing sophistication of storytelling or the shifting sands of tech, will be left behind. And basically, that's where we are, the increasing sophistication of storytelling. We've got shows like Breaking Bad that were something like 64 hours. It was crazy. But just a way of turning the episode every time. You've got ideas like those big shows like Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, that they, they make you wait a week for the next episode. Because that week that you're waiting is where everybody rushes online. Oh my God, what do you think? Is he going to die? Is this going to happen? They make you wait. Shows like Kimmy Schmidt, Arrested Development, uh, Bojack Horseman, stuff like that. It's binge, binge, binge. Cleverly designed. Some of them are 17 minutes. Some are 45 minutes. Just enough that you're laying in bed and your eyes are like that, and you go, I'm just going to watch another one. I'm just going to watch another one, right? Well, that's what I do anyway. Um, really cleverly done, that you keep people engaged. Hey, genuine, relevant, and credible. They're the three words I always use, and I get quite boring as I keep saying it. But you have to be genuine in your storytelling. You have to be genuine in the platforms you use. And you have to be genuine to your audience. Equally, platforms, story, and audience, or sorry, pla yeah, platform, story, and audience, you have to be relevant to those people, and you have to be credible. 
If you're not, you're, you're hitting the wrong spot and they'll be bored and they'll walk away. This is a little clip I want to show you. This is actually from Conductor, and I didn't work on this project. Um, but this, for me, is a like, detective series, Ruby Sky PI absolutely knows who their audience are. It's teenage girls. And the, um, the interactions are woven into the story. I've left you 11 puzzles. If I were looking for the will, I'd probably try to think like the woman who dresses like a rabbit. Look at this, clue number one. It's really important to change the way we create and design and write our content for this new medium, putting the audience right at the center of everything we do. Need a clue? Send me an email. It is so creatively fulfilling and exciting, and that's because of the interactivity with the audience. I've been cut off from my audience for my entire career as a storyteller, and yet, as a storyteller, your first and most important natural partner is the person you're telling the story to. What could this number mean? Could this be clue two? Well, I would always say, oh, well, I'll just, you know, hop on the character's Twitter feed and answer their tweets, or I'll write all their blog posts and, and uh, respond to all the comments, and, and everyone would say, well, that's great if you have 100 followers. What are you going to do when you have 1,000 or 10,000? How, how's it going to be scalable? <laughs> and then along came Conductor. Not only would it allow me to interact with a very large audience, but also it allows you to incorporate interactive elements right into your storytelling without being a technician. It's part of a larger puzzle. If you can't figure it out, consult Colin Singleton. It's an anagram. Help find the will. Solve Ava's puzzles at rubyskypi.com. It's a dream come true for storytellers and for audiences, really. <laughs> And I know that Belen is here to speak to you a bit later about Conductor. I've worked with Conductor a few times. It is brilliant in terms of enabling those interactions. You can actually have characters respond to telephone calls, respond to emails. Really, really nice. I'm not going to tell you too much about Conductor because I know that she'll do a far better job than me. But that was woven right into the series, as you could see. Those calls to action and those triggers were baked in. So if we look at special source, which makes these two different, okay? We've got Star Wars and Star Trek. They both feel like they're quite a similar type of story. We're both like always out in space and we're fighting some kind of rebel forces all the way through. But the thing that makes these different goes right back to my map of figuring out your story, your theme, your story world. Star Trek was quite clearly a vision of how we would be in the future. I'm glad we're not, because I'd look really bad in those clothing, right? <laughs> so that was supposed to be this is where we're going to be. Star Wars actually never quite claims to be that. And the story world of Star Wars is quite interesting because in terms of like their ships and their fighting guns and all what they've got of their technology, it's way more evolved than Star Trek. And yet you look at somewhere like Tatooine, like you're back in the nomadic desert days. It raises so many questions that aren't answered. Is this way, way, way back in time and something happened that we're now where we are? Or is this what, is this what the future looks like? Do we go back to these nomadic desert times and yet we have all of this technology? So many unanswered questions in Star Wars. Star Trek is far more surface level. So when you're looking at building your story worlds, and I said about special source, what can you sprinkle in? Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Hunter. Who saw that one coming, right? Story about a guy who wants to revenge the vampire that killed his mother, and yet, you know, it's Abraham Lincoln. Just those kinds of little tricks and that special source really help add richness to your story. Time, but I just want to show you this quickly. It's my time. Oh. Already, pull out, pull out. My bad. I'm pregnant. I'm sick all the time, I'm getting fat, and Abe doesn't want to screw me no more. I know that once I have the baby, Abe will be so excited, he'll start treating me nice again, even when we're not having sex. 
I don't know what to think about Cece's new life. Oh my god, Prima, I don't know what the f happened. Like, yesterday I had this cute little baby bump, and today, look. I blown up like a f***ing global. How am I supposed to choreograph around a belly? And if you have any friends that are pregnant, tell them to write me too so I can see how they're dealing with this stuff. Soli Gomez here for the East Los Siren. Unless you're here to sign up for the newspaper, you can leave because I'm busy. I'm signing up. You're signing up. Well, guys can ask me the questions and I can find out the answers for them. How about that? Okay, let's try you out. Yo, what's up? It's Polly here with the first edition of Correct Ask Polly. If you got any questions about sex or dating, you could click the link below. I got a great question here for you today. How and what do you do to pleasure your partner? Oh, she. If a girl's worried about, about getting a disease or getting pregnant, She's not gonna be relaxed. Is this your diary? No, it's just my, my recipes. Get that. You wanna put my food on the menu? Yeah, it's tasty. Some of y'all been asking about our new menu at Tio Pepe. So I wanna introduce to you our newest cook, Maya Martinez. What's up? All right, we're making tacos with butternut squash and beans. Mmm, cilantro, some salsa verde. Ah. Mm. Hey, boom. No, no, there's a bunch of you out there that have a healthy Mexican recipe of your own. So send it in, and you never know, we might put it on our special. Today, we're gonna teach you the routine that all future Bomb Squad girls had to learn for the East Los High Dance. I'm going to show you how to get Vanessa's signature look. Let's create some bright and fun highlights. And we're done. Hey, what's up? It's Javi right here in beautiful Boyle Heights at the Mariachi Plaza. The love and the devotion I have to our people. <laughs> Okay, I, that's like a case study that I could talk to you about for about an hour, and I don't have time to do that. You can find that on YouTube or online. If you just do East Los High Transmedia Trailer, it's actually worth a closer look. Because when I, right at the beginning, I said start with why. The why of that is because there had been found that the Latino communities of East Los Angeles had a really high pregnancy rate amongst teenage girls, like alarmingly so. These young girls were becoming pregnant at even 12, 13 years old. And they knew something had to be done as a result to try and prevent that from keep happening. So of course it could have been this like wah, 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 in the schools, which none of them are gonna listen to. They knew exactly who their audiences were. And it was decided that the best way to reach those young girls and the young guys to give them some kind of sense of consequence, I suppose, was this. Now, a lot of money went into this. There was lots of different partners involved. That's not the point. The point of it is it rolled out on Hulu as a web series that ran kind of quite in a linear fashion. But if you go back and look at that and find it online, you see there's two websites. There's the East Los High website, which you can look at in Spanish or in English and you can dig into the story. But there's also The Siren. The Siren was the newspaper or magazine of the fictitious school. And within The Siren, there's lots of articles in there. There are lots of ways to, that the audience could engage. So Tio Pepe was the, um, the restaurant, and you saw in that short clip, if you've got a recipe of your own, send it in. So many people sent their recipes in, and they were able to pull some of them into the show. That's the kind of payoff you want to give your audience that their recipe is in the show, or, or even on the website. Um, they had ways for the young girls to follow fashion. They had the idea of following the dance moves so you could pick up on that. They also went into East LA with the, like, the food trucks for the tacos and stuff so people could experience the food. Lots of lots of different ways. But the smartest thing was 
the guy who says he wants to work for the newspaper for the siren to get tips on sex or dating. Like, he's the most unconvincing character that you would go to for advice on sex or dating, right? He's like, oh, yeah, come and ask me. I know it all. Like, he's not the kind of person that you would think would have the answers, perhaps. However, for the young girls and guys to ask him, he was not a threat at all. He wasn't some dude with the six-pack, like, yeah, I know it all, come and talk to me, right? He was like, yeah, well, if I don't know, I'll find out, kind of thing. The people that emailed him, the questions they asked was a perfect way of finding out where the lack of education was because they could email that character anonymously. Nobody would know the stupid questions they would be asking about sex or dating. And it absolutely would uncover where the problems did really lie by the fact that they could engage with a real character and ask the questions. It was absolutely huge in terms of finding out these things that maybe would be assumed that these kids knew but didn't know. So I like that for many reasons. They knew who their audiences were. They knew how to engage with them. Some of the sex scenes, you know, the things that she's saying at the beginning. Um, a lot of people have looked at that and gone, oh, no, like for 13-year-olds. However, they're the ones getting pregnant. They know that's happening already. They had to take it out there. I presented that once to a religious organisation and I had to ask for permission to show that scene at the beginning where they're having sex together. And I did win the fact I could show it because of the fact that that is who their audience were and that's how their audience were behaving. So it was absolutely not for the shock factor. It was completely relevant, genuine and credible. So to finish up with story, which is where we began, this is a quote, oh, sorry. This is a quote by um, Robert McKee, Hollywood script uh, consultant. And this, wherever it says story here, you should look at that as well in terms of a transmedia approach to your storytelling. Eternal, universal forms and not formulas. You cannot take a blueprint of something that's been done for another film or show and lay it onto yours. Because audiences change, your story will be slightly different, platforms evolve. Archetypes, not stereotypes. Thoroughness and not shortcuts. You try and make a shortcut, you save a bit of time, you'll hit a wall at some point and have to go back and figure out the hard questions. Master the art, don't second guess the marketplace. That's why I like the runway phase. Because, say for example with my books, I thought I knew who my readers were. I didn't really. Spying on them in the bookshop wasn't the best way to figure it out, right? So really get a sense and do the research. Get the metrics and the data. Who is your audience? What are they already watching? Where are they hanging out online? Um, respect and not disdain for the audience. If you're asking them to do anything, let it be that they say after, oh my God, that was fantastic. Like under promise and over deliver on every question that you ask your audience to do. Let them walk away and go, wow, I thought I was just clicking on that and this whole thing blew up. Really respect your audience. They're the ones, actually, that will help you to prove your concept even when you're trying to get this sold. And originality, not duplication. Like I've said, you try and copy what somebody else has done, you might be able to take a few little triggers, but every single story has a slightly different prescription who your audience are, your budget, your pacing, your timing, why you're telling it. Every single story has a slightly different twist, which is what makes it so amazing, but also makes it so difficult. And I am done, and I think I'm on time, so that was actually a miracle. Um, but yes, thank you, I think that's it. Yes, good. Um, I don't know if I've got time for questions or not. Do I have time for questions? Oh, OK, brilliant. OK, OK. I have a very, very quick question. Okay. I know. The big questions for the wrap-up session. Um, um, learning about successful storytelling. Mm -hmm. So what can you learn? You, you've said uh, go beyond demographics with your audience. What can you learn from a successful storytelling experience about your audience for future projects? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I think audiences never act as you would expect them to act. I think prototyping little ideas in that runway phase is highly valuable. I worked with some guys that were telling a detective story through an app that ran for five days for 35-year-old men, and they found that a lot of mid to late 40-year-old women were following it, 
because they loved the dynamic of romance between two of the main characters, mm -hmm. who actually were two guys, right? So you can learn things like that. They were really disappointed. They were like, oh, no, we thought we were telling this for the guys. And they were disappointed that all of these women were liking their story. But I think the idea is to be adapting to that as well, mm -hmm. you know? So you can learn how far you can push them, what they would like to do. In terms of asking them questions, you can get feedback from them. In terms of telling a story, perhaps it's quite specialised. There was a story that I was working on that was about medieval torture. Don't ask. Um, <laughs> and the creator was putting out her vision of medieval torture. And through a short campaign, we ran it out on social media and she learnt so much. Her audience is stepping forward, sending her photographs, links to articles, and she ended up bringing some of them in, mm -hmm. like behind the curtain, and they helped her to carry it forward. Writing can be quite a solitary, lonely experience, and we can be in a little bit of a bubble sometimes when we do it. So there's so much that we can learn from our audience. And actually, in TV, and for TV companies, TV shows, you can just use everything you learn from, from one episode to another, just yeah. to, for marketing, promotion, yes. and even for the writer's room. Yes, but it's really about looking at your audience. And we never used to do that. We'd like the broadcast model, tell a story down a pipeline and not really know what they think. And it was quite good, perhaps, mm -hmm. that we didn't know, right? So that's the path to relevance, <laughs> exactly. to be relevant for the audience. Exactly, yeah. So there's loads in terms of um, adding um, tangible ideas, adding historical facts that you might have missed. If they feel loyal and part of your team, they will then start promoting what you've done because they can then say, I was a part of this. Mm -hmm. I helped advise on this or I helped to build that. So it helps you to build a team of loyal advocates, really. Yeah, the strongest ones, yes. actually. But the quickest thing as well, not the quickest thing, the biggest thing I feel too is to fail fast. Like it's quite scary as a writer to put years into a piece of work and then to get it wrong. But the idea of failing quickly in that runway or even that development phase, put little bits out there mm -hmm. and don't be embarrassed that people get it wrong or they don't like it because that's how you're going to get better and better at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. That's so, a challenge for TV executives. Absolutely. And, uh, absolutely absolutely the difficult. The, yeah, the philosophy of your writing and your promotion. Yes. But just the idea of, I mean, I was even speaking to some big, big companies over the last two or three weeks that are looking for ways to fail fast on small budget ideas around massive budget mm -hmm. movies because they want to test the market and see who likes what. The comedian Chris Rock mm -hmm. does the massive, massive sellout shows at Vegas or wherever. But he fails quickly because he goes around the US and does little shows in the small towns and villages for like $30. So the people in the towns and villages are like, my God, Chris Rock's in town and we can see him for 30 bucks. But what actually is happening is Chris Rock is testing out all of his jokes and all of his stories. And his people are there going, yeah, that one worked. Damn, that one didn't work. By the time he gets to Vegas, every single thing, it just hits the spot. So it's a win-win because the people that have seen his show in the villages and towns go, yeah, that little bit was a bit not great, but these bits were great. They've got something for their money. They're happy. And then the people at the big shows are like, wow, everything he do did delivers. So the idea of failing fast like that means that when you hit the big time, it's just polished and smooth. A mm -hmm. lot to be said for that. So we have a lot of questions for the wrap-up session. We really do. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of questions. No? <laughs> a lot. I mean, a That's lot. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank it's you. It's really challenging, exciting, and yeah. really, I learned a lot, actually. Yeah. Thank Thanks you so much. much. And thank you all as well. It was all really cool. Thank you.